I want us to look a little today at these lessons, and, it, and as well as the opening column, because what these lessons say is in direct contradiction to almost everything that we hear about what it means to be human, what it means to succeed, and what it means to thrive in, on TV, uh, media, culture, we say something very, very, very different. And therefore, it's important to hold that up and understand what it is that we are saying that we believe. So, and it really starts immediately with the colic. Colics were written specifically to capture a very specific biblical thought that will be underscored by the lessons that will, that will be read after the collect. And Cranner, the author of most of our collects, hits a home run with this one. In terms of its plainness, its clarity, and it's the very first line. Almighty, do you know where we are if you want to look? Please feel free to do so. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. What? <laughs> Really? See, the whole focus of our, our culture is that we actually have great power to help ourselves. And the problem is, if there is one, is that we don't know how to tap it. We don't have enough education to be able to do so. We don't have enough training to be able to do so. We don't have the right mentors to be able to access what it is that we have. And therefore, if we're going to cure the ills of our society and, the, and our culture, what is required is better education, better programs, better mentoring, stronger relationships. Right? <coughs> On your head. Yes. Now, I'm not against any of those things. I think you ought to get a good education. I think you do need to be well informed about what's going on, especially in your own life. I think you do need the wise counsel and advice of other people particularly to be able to figure things out in the midst of all of the competing voices that often say contradictory things, depending on what talk show you listen to, or news commentator you pay attention to, or what book you're reading, etc., etc., etc. Everybody wants to come at you with what they think is the most accurate, up-to-date, and helpful information for you and for your life, right? I sound like a television drama. <laughs> so when Cranmer sounds... As a result, Cranmer often sounds to us, if not dead wrong, then really quite out of step. And it is, this is especially true, is it not, as our bodies continue to age. That means I need to work harder, you see, at protecting myself and keeping myself healthy. Exercise, getting the medication, making sure my diet's straight, continuing to read or crossword puzzles and other things to make sure that my mind stays alert, trying to stave off, as it were, the eventual effects of aging. So, and that the key to all of that is the fact that I actually have power to be able to do that. Now, so obviously Cranmer is talking about something deeper than either continuing to develop intellectual acumen or staying physically fit. Otherwise, it would be laughable. And actually, not merely laughable, but actually dangerous. Because we would be, in essence, undervaluing the power of human potential. Are you with me? Yeah. So the question is, when Cranmer says we have no power in and of ourselves to help ourselves, what's he really talking about? What he's talking about is the call, the invitation, the joy, in fact, of coming into a whole new relationship with God that transforms everything that we are and brings, for many of us, the very forgiveness, health, grace, peace, and mercy that, in fact, our heart longs for. Which is why Solomon, for example, in the writer of Proverbs, a man of, in his time of extraordinary wealth, incredible education, one of, the most, one of the best informed people of his generation said, you know, I've in essence tried it all. 
and it doesn't satisfy. It is, in fact, vanity. So we're invited, especially in this Lenten season, to think in a clear way about things that our culture actually rarely addresses, which has everything to do with the deepest and most powerful, in fact, part of who we are, which is who we are as men and women, broken yet made in the image of God, and in need of God's grace, mercy, power, and forgiveness to really become the men and women that God intends us to be. A journey, a quest, a kind of adventure that is in fact lifelong, that carries us from the earliest points of our life straight through, all through adulthood, into old age, and finally welcoming us into the very gate of eternity itself. And the scripture is really clear. If we're not paying attention to that journey in our life, something is desperately out of whack. We're paying attention to, in essence, all the wrong things. What is it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? That, that was actually the gospel reading just last week. So we're here for this particular point in our lives to think about, okay, what does it mean for God to be active and at work in helping us face ultimate things? And therefore, if they are ultimate, they are in fact the most important. Are you with me on that? It's not common that many people are, I have to confess to you, because what most men and women in the pew, and I want sort of all of it, all this and heaven too, um, what I want is in fact is to continue to be healthy and educated and do all those things, to be well thought of, to be able to carry on a great conversation over the course of the dinner party, to know what the latest novel has to say, to talk about the headlines, to be able to quote a commentator that I heard on the news, and at the same time be versed in the Bible and be able to talk to people about my relationship with Jesus. And if there's a conflict between the two, or if I don't have time to do all of that, but almost always take second, third, fourth, fifth place, has to do with dealing with ultimate things because, I mean, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, what the scripture is saying is, boy, are you missing the boat. And there is, in fact, no voice calling you to think about your life in those priorities except the voice of what we hear in the scripture. Only Jesus, in the midst of all of those competing voices, literally cries out from the scripture and says, Seek first the kingdom of God. Yes. That is an entirely vacant voice in terms of the rest of the world. And so we're really here to talk about that. And I, I want you to know, I talk like this not just because I'm a bishop, but because I really believe this with all my heart. I know that without him, I have nothing to offer of any substantive value at all. And in fact, in Christ, there is the freedom for, in, for me to become all that God intended, who knows me better than I know myself, who has placed within me talent, gifts, all the things that you hope, and allows them to, to <coughs> prosper and to flourish in a way that can only happen under the authority of his blessing. In other words, if I were not a believer in Jesus Christ and submitted to his life and wisdom, I would be less than who I am. Less. And it's very specific. It is about faith in Jesus Christ. It's not just in any sort of spirituality that helps me to become who I'm, I'm intended to be. No, 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 no. A part of what especially the lesson, Paul's lesson in 1 Corinthians is, has to say so clearly, is that God has done something in Jesus Christ that he has done in no other human being and in no other place. So, with that in mind, let's walk a little bit through the lessons, very briefly. When you hear the Old Testament lessons, which were the recitation of the Ten Commandments, and the explanations that are written in about why this happens to be important around some of them, particularly around idolatry and, and things like that. I hope what you hear is, as they are read, a kind of spiritual checklist. 
okay, Lord, what are you asking me to do? And you go through and say, God help me. In fact, when this is done liturgically, the response is, Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Because if you take the commandment seriously, and in fact, given all that we wrestle with in our lives, it, it's not a particular, it's enlightening, but it's not particularly affirming. <laughs> because the role of what the law does is in fact meant to not only lay out an ideal, but also show us in bright, great clarity where we need to change. But our shortcomings <clears throat> are. <clears throat> these, in, these, in other words, are not meant to be, oh, I can do that. Just the opposite. And in fact, that's what Jesus does, if you recall the way he uses these. You've heard it said, thou shalt not steal. But I say it to you, and he just ups the ante even a little bit more. Um, you know, if you covet in your heart, it's just all there anyway. See, in other words, it's not for, for Jesus, therefore for us, since we are Jesus' followers. It's not only a matter of the outward deed, it also has to do with the intentions of the heart that often lead us to the outward deed. God, who can change the intentions of his heart? No therapy can do that. We're talking about something much, much deeper than very good psychological counseling. And it's not that I don't believe in psychological counseling. Again, we're dealing with something that actually is more potent than that. And so going through the Ten Commandments, on the one hand, okay, I, got, I get it, God. You've not changed, and this is what you're asking us. But to be, tell you the truth, my heart needs some help in the midst of this. Oh, God. See, this is when Cranmer's prayer begins to actually kick in with some teeth. We have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. I can't change the inclinations of my heart. I might learn through therapy how to find better ways to say no to the base and false inclinations that are in me, right? Or I can better discover where they come from. Yeah, I'm just as angry as my father ever was. That's how I learned about my bad temper. And maybe I'm learning through therapy how to keep that in check. But what that doesn't do actually is change the very nature of my heart. I just don't show it as often. So yeah, I'm gaining a little bit in the area of self-control. But only God can actually cleanse and replace that tendency with his nature that actually changes how I feel inside. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. That, because that's what Cranmer's trying to get at. He's trying to get at this ultimate issue of what's actually happening within the content of the human heart that is much deeper, stronger, more powerful, and in fact more important than either changing the outward behavior or learning how to keep the bad behavior in check. Now believe me, if our culture didn't have those things, we'd be in a terrible mess. In some places we already are. So I'm not degrading those things, but I'm trying to put them in context to what we're talking about here, which is the matter of the deepest things that are inside of us, that God knows about in very personal ways. That's why in the, in the Eucharist service we often go through, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known. I mean, it's all there. He gets it. He understands. <coughs> so, what Paul does in dealing with this very issue is point us to the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. Right there. Because it says two things that are very, very important. When he talks about the message of the cross. What does he mean? He means, number one, Jesus came to show us who, who God is like. He says at one point to his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, in the midst of all of the ideas about who God may be, what Jesus is saying, I am, you're looking at it. I am the complete, perfect clear, utterly true, without any falsehood, image of who God himself is like. So in the midst of all of your conversations about, well, what do you think? Well, I think God's this, and I think God might be that. 
But what Jesus is trying to say is, in Jesus, we have a very clear picture. So it's contradictory to say, I think God is like that, if you don't see that in Jesus. He is the exact likeness of the invisible God that Paul says, as Paul says in Colossians. So number one, what does that tell us about God? It says that God loves us so personally, so deeply, and so powerfully that he would literally send his son to die on our behalf. <coughs> Greater love has no man than this, than he laid out his life for his friends. You, Jesus says to his disciples, are my friends. And that's what we see in the cross. Which means we can come to him regardless of what we've done or where we've been, and know that what we will see in God in that moment, even if we confess the worst of what it is that's going on in our lives, what he will, we will hear from him is, even in the way he said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've struggled with, no matter what's going on inside that you don't tell anybody about, in Jesus, there is, in fact, healing and mercy and forgiveness. I, I, I noticed this not too long ago. Larley and I are big fans of PBS Mysteries. We love them, especially the British ones. We watch almost all of them. We DVR them and we go back and watch them later. And one of the things that I've noticed, particularly in some of the recent ones, are men who deeply and powerfully continue to shake and struggle with post-traumatic stress over the wicked, evil things that they did within the context of war. And, and one of my good friends, a guy named Nigel Mumford of RIT, who served in the Royal Air Force, has a powerful ministry of healing and prayer. And one of the things he does, literally all over the country, is work with vets and pray with vets who struggle with post-traumatic stress because of the things they've seen and the, because of the things that they have done. And because he knows deeply within him that there is nothing that is beyond the healing power of Jesus Christ. Nothing. And he's there to talk about it in very clear first-person terms. I've been through this too. I am your fellow strugglers, and I know there's healing in Christ Jesus. So that... In him, Jesus dying on our behalf literally brings forgiveness and mercy to all, not just some, all of who we are, everything that we have been. That's what we see in the cross of Christ. That is the message of the cross, is that God loves you supremely and powerfully like no other, and that what, to number two, he brings to you out of that is not just an image of sacrifice, but a sacrifice that is directly applied to your behalf, regardless of your need, whatever the need is. And in fact, it can all be forgiven, healed, and restored through the shed blood of Jesus. That's the message of the cross. Now, he says to the Greeks, that's foolishness. And he's absolutely right. You read Aristotle, Plato, or any of the Roman philosophers, all those people, it's all about human accomplishment. And Paul's here to say human accomplishment can only get you so far, especially if in how we deal with our insides, we have no power to deal with the ultimate things. We need God to break through in our lives. So sure, to the Greeks, it's foolishness. To the Jews, it makes no sense at all because they see nothing that would point to them that somehow that God, I mean, to talk about a crucified Messiah is an, an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. Who is the Messiah? He's the one who's going to come in majestic glory and defeat his enemies and establish his kingdom. Die on the cross? Cursed are those who hang on the tree, that it says in Deuteronomy. How could that be? It makes no sense. And that's the point, you see. It's not meant to make sense. Instead, it's meant to be received. Where I come to the very edge of my capacity to understand and know that what is being shown to me in the cross of Christ is in fact my capacity to understand. So that instead all I'm invited to do is to kneel, 
before him and say, my Lord and my God, because all that you offer is everything that I need. That's the message of the cross. So, today, as we are walking in this Lenten season, anticipating Good Friday and the powerful resurrection of Easter, I, I would invite you to think about your life from this perspective. To take the time to think and ponder, where do I need the power of God in my life? Where do I need his healing and his grace and his mercy? Where do I need for him to come and do things in my heart that I cannot do for myself because I'm here to tell you he is willing to do it. He is willing to do it. Why? Because as you are, he loves you deeply, completely, and entirely. <coughs> That's what I've given my life to. And I would do nothing less because he gave his life for us. So I'm here today in confidence and with some authority to be able to say to you, in the midst of all of the wandering, in the midst of all of the brokenness, in the midst of all the tragedies as well as the joy, there is an invitation to come and to be one with the Savior who brings all that you need in forgiveness, in healing, in mercy, and even the promise of eternal life. And these are things that you can find nowhere and all it takes is the simple yielding, the challenging yielding to him. That's why we call him Lord. Let us pray together. Oh Lord, I thank you that you are gracious and that you are kind, that you make room for the worst of us as well as the best of us, and that you invite us in. And that in you, we can know your protection and grace and your healing mercy. Giving us the capacity to literally be carried through even the worst of circumstances. So Lord, this morning, and especially as we welcome new people into the life of this congregation, I pray that you would help us all to say in new ways yes to you and that you might work your best in us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.